We will sing, Come, let us join our cheerful songs. And that hymn captures the chorus before the throne of God in heaven, before the Lamb, as they praise God and the Lord Jesus. And 93, come, let us join our cheerful songs. Are we there? If we're there, we can uh, stand to sing. Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. Ten thousand, thousand are their tongues, but all their joys are one. Worthy the Lamb that died, they cried, to be exalted dust. Worthy the Lamb, our lips replied, for he was slain for us. Jesus is worthy to receive honor, power divine, and blessings more than we can give. Be Lord forever thine. The whole creation join in one to bless the sacred name of him that sits upon the throne and to adore the Lamb. Amen. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer before we come to our text this evening. <coughs> Father, may we know the joy and the delight and the privilege of coming before your presence to worship you. It is a great thing and it, it is our greatest honor to come before your presence. Thank you for everyone who came here this evening because we love you, we love your word. You have brought us here and we thank you that we are here and we are mindful of, of our brothers and sisters who are not able to join us this evening. We ask that your presence will be with them, that you have mercy upon us, Lord, that this gathering will be unto your name and it will be blessed, Lord, and that you accomplish so much amongst us as we go through your word and as we later offer up our prayers, Lord, this uh, service is your opportunity. It's your opportunity to work. It's your opportunity to give to us. It's our opportunity to receive from you because you are a gracious God. You are a God who is good and who uh, gives every good and perfect gift. So we ask that your name will be glorified. We just humble ourselves before your presence, before your word. We know many times as we come in contact with scripture, Lord, we know that some of the words are really hard. We pray that you would give us understanding by your spirit. It is not the work <coughs> of a preacher, Lord. It is the work of your spirit. It says in 1 John that we have an anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that teaches us all things. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. Come and teach us. Come and explain these uh, words of God that we can understand it and receive it and it can be a blessing to our souls that we will walk in the light of all that we've heard in obedience, Lord, so that we will know the blessings of this uh, precious word. So be with our brethren. We pray for the heavens, Lord, be with them, uh, comfort them, help them, strengthen them, heal them, restore them. Pray the same for um, uh, the toppings, Lord, help them with the situations, Lord, draw near to them. We pray for Adrian, Lord, bless him, restore him, Lord. And uh, we, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, show your power, even as we come to pray later uh, for ourselves, for this chapel, for our brethren, Lord, and your work in, 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 in amongst us here and in other churches and in this nation as a whole. And all that concerns us as we bring these things to you in prayers. We ask, Lord, that you would be mighty uh, to hear these prayers and answer and, 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 and do uh, a great work amongst us, Lord, in answer to prayers. So thank you for... Uh, this time, and we ask that we, you, we will know your leading as we continue for the glory of your great name. Amen. 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 Okay, today we are looking at 
Revelation 14. Revelation 14. And uh, what we discover in this book is that John is having a series of visions and many things that we read in here it's it's uh, if you look at it it's like pieces to a puzzle and we've been given this this set with so many pieces and we have to take a piece and put it and make all these connections and we will begin to see a picture and that picture it's about the lamb winning the battle against evil the lamb ruling and reigning the redeemed entering into everlasting rest being rewarded and the wicked being judged and that is what we find here this is the, 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 this is the, the whole picture that we see so as we go through the book sometimes obviously we have to have an open bible before us and look at these verses and see what the Bible is saying. And sometimes we may go back home with the scripture and prayerfully go over again what we have looked at uh, to have more understanding for the Lord to uh, 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 reveal his truths to us in his word. And sometimes we may even need to hear the message again. Go back and listen to the recording in order to get more understanding. So I believe as we give our hearts to God's word and, and like the Bereans, uh, go back home, search the scripture, read these things. I have a heart to know this truth that God will be gracious and merciful to give us understanding and to help us uh, receive something from this book, something that he wants us uh, to know. It's, uh, it's a challenging book. If you read the commentaries, you see that um, a good commentators in times past and Bible uh, scholars, they differ on different things we find in this book. You know, but the main thing is that we hold on to those truths that God is revealing to us. And we walk in humility, we walk in love. Uh, Christ did not say, by your complete understanding of the book of Revelation, that is how uh, everyone will know that you are my disciples. He didn't say that. He said, by your love for one another. So let's have humble hearts and let's seek to love each other and let's respect the different views you know, as far as um, uh, the, the study of this book. And let's uh, look to God who is uh, our teacher. So let's read chapter 14 and read from <clears throat> verse 1 to the end. Chapter 14. The Lord bless his word to our hearts. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their heads. And their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the four hundred and forty four thousand who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. For they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, carrying a cry with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Trust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud trust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are tr- fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 forlorns. Amen. 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 What amazing words uh, we find here which has to do with events at this point in human history. On the backdrop of this, we have the satanic state of the world with the alliance of the dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the earth, which is Satan. Satan is the dragon, the beast from the sea, the antichrist, and the beast from the earth, the false prophets. You have this unholy trinity as it were this ungodly alliance presiding over the world we uh, looked at this in detail when we covered chapter 13 the antichrist which gets its power from satan uh, verse 2 of chapter 13 uh, this antichrist is linked to nations seeking to be united with this worldly ruler this worldly ruler obviously dominates them by deceit and force. This worldly ruler is the Antichrist and he gets his power from Satan. The false prophet uh, who is with the Antichrist, it follows the Antichrist, this false prophet embodies the false religious system of the world. He imitates the, res- the resurrection, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He imitates the miracles of God. He is a false prophet. He is doing signs and wonders upon the earth to, de- to deceive people. And these are, these are one of the things that will characterize the end times before the Lord comes. It is deception. When Christ, again, was asked what would be the sign of his coming, the sign before the end of the age, he said, take heed that no man deceives you. So this antichrist, uh, this false prophet, would um, be deceiving people. He embodies, this entity embodies the false religious system of the world. And this has to do with the economical worship. Okay, the economical worship. And this is the precursor to one world religion. All the religions of the world coming together and claiming to all worship God. And this is deception. And this is what you find uh, today in the interfaith movement and all claiming to worship the same God but this is not what the Bible teaches Christ tells us that he is the only way to God he is the only way to God and you have to go through Christ to get to God that's why he said in John fourteen six, I am the way the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And Jesus Christ is not only the way to God, 
He is the only way to God. But this false religious system in the world believe Christ is not the only way to God. And even in our day and time, you hear of several so-called church leaders saying that there are other ways to God. They deny the deity and humanity of Christ as the only mediator between God and man. This is the spirit of the false prophet, the spirit of the Antichrist, which is already in the world, the false religious system, which will deceive many. This is the work of the false prophet, the beast which comes out of the earth and has the appearance of a lamb. That's what it says in verse 11 of chapter 13. He has the appearance of a lamb. He has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like the dragon. It looks like Christ. Christ said there will be false Christ. It looks like Christ, but he has the voice of Satan. This is deception. And many upon the earth will be deceived. Verse 14 of chapter 13. They will be deceived. Those who dwell upon the earth, they will be deceived by his works. Causing them to worship the image of the beast. Causing them to worship the Antichrist. That is what it is about. It is, a worship. It is about the worship of God. But man, humanity, the world will not worship this God creator. They will give their worship to a false God. That's why God created man, that man may worship him. But man is taking the worship of God and giving it to the worship of devil. The false prophet is the head of this world religious system, which is illustrative of a city called Babylon, verse 8 of our text, chapter 14. This false religious system is illustrative of, of this city called Babylon. That's what they mean there in verse 8 of chapter 14, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations personalized. She's a person, she's an entity. This is false system. She has made all nations, the whole world, drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's idolatry. Spiritual fornication. Living your love for God. God who is your love. And loving other things. Idolatry. That is spiritual fornication. That's what it, what it means there. They're taking the worship of God, their love for God, and giving it to something else. And the readers of John's letter, uh, they would have understand this to be Rome. Okay? That, as far as the context of uh, the, the, their time when John was writing. They were under the Roman Empire and they would have understood this whole false religious system to be the religion of the Roman Empire with its idolatry and paganism, the worship of so many gods. And this is significant because presently for us in this time, because the Bible it didn't just speak then, it spoke then to uh, the people of that time. You have to look at it, obviously, in, his, in, in its historical context, what it meant then. But it is also applicable to us in this our time. It's a prophetic book. It is a living book. That is why you find some things there which are still yet to be fulfilled, which are still speaking into the future, even though it was written uh, hundreds of years ago. The Roman Empire for us in, this, in the here and now is no longer here. Uh, yet... What we read here, because these are events that characterize the last days before Christ coming glory. The scripture here is alluding to the fact that the false religious system of Rome will still be active at the end of human history. That's why we're reading uh, the type of words we're reading here about this whole false worship system, which is known as Babylon. And what you have at this time is nations seeking to be united. They'll be seeking to come together and the false worship system of Rome would still be standing in it. Will still be active amongst these nations of the earth seeking, come, seeking to come together. And Daniel 2, if you write down Daniel 2, when you go back home, you see Daniel 2, or when you have uh, 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 some time, when you read Daniel 2, Daniel 2 kind of explains 
uh, uh, this. And this gives us the idea of a revived Roman Empire. And we know that this is talking about that false worship system. That is what would be revived. And Daniel says that this will happen. If you read Daniel 2, Daniel says that this will happen before God comes to set up his kingdom, which will destroy all the kingdoms of this world and stand forever. Now, when Christ came, his first advent during the time of the Romans, that kingdom came in a spiritual sense. It came into how we believe into the kingdom. It says the kingdom is amongst you, is in you. The kingdom came in the, in the person of the king of kings. The kingdom was not you know, an outward in manifestation then. But scripture alludes to the fact that the Christ is coming again. He's going to have a second advent. And there will be a time when there will be new heavens and the new earth. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. The kingdom of God, as it were, will be in a bodily and literal sense. When Christ comes again in glory. Christ is coming again. You know, so that's why the things we read here, which pertains to his second advent, this thing still holds true. He is coming again. There is a kingdom that is still coming in the person of Christ, the king, who is coming. He's coming. There is a coming kingdom. Uh, just to mention this as well, it's interesting to note that the uh, Protestants, uh, church fathers, and the Puritans, they saw the Roman Catholic Church as this false religious system. That is how they interpreted these things during their time, and they regarded the Pope as the false uh, a prophet. So, in light of the times we're living in, we have to be discerning about these things, and we have to be watchful. That's what Christ says. said, take heed, be watchful, take heed that no man deceives you, so that we will not be deceived, especially with these false religious systems of this day. Churches, different faiths coming together, and believing that uh, uh, Christ is not only the way to God. And they believe in that they all worship the same God. That is false. That is an unholy alliance. And as we see later, um, the, 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 the declaration to the people of God is that come out for, from her. Come out of Babylon. Come out of this false religious system. Have no part of it. So, this, this will be the context, this false religious system. It will be the context before the Lord comes in glory. On one hand, you have the false prophet deceiving the world, uh, the Antichrist uh, being worshipped by the world, Satan full of rage against Israel. You see that in uh, Revelation 12, when we cover Revelation 12, as well as Daniel 11. Daniel 11, you see how it's like the, the Antichrist goes into agreement, a covenant with Israel. But in, 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 the, in the middle of that, that uh, time that she's, he's made a covenant with her, he breaks the covenant and you read about uh, his rage against the people of God. And we find as well in, in, in verse 17 of chapter 12, Revelation, that this dragon, the devil, he goes to make war with the offspring of the woman. And we establish that this woman is Israel. So we'll read about there in Revelation 12. This woman is Israel. Okay, and he's full of rage against her. And he goes, he can harm her because God is preserving her. But he goes to make war with her offspring. And he says there are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So on the other hand, you have many faithful witnesses overcoming both in life and in death. They, 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 they keep the commandments of God. They, 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 they have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have God preserving Israel and his saints, his people. And in our passage, we see more of this contrast. Okay, and it's really about... A tale of two people. That's what I've uh, uh, titled uh, today's Bible study. A tale of two people. Two groups of people. Those who are of the world 
and those who are of God. Those who follow the dragon, Satan, and those who follow the lamb. Those who worship the Antichrist and those who worship Christ. So our passage in, in chapter 14, uh, I believe it has to do with the Jewish elect. Okay, John looks, verse 1, and behold, in his vision, he sees a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. This is not the first time we are seeing this group of people, this 144,000. And many times when we see a similar name or similar number, we have to go back to where we saw it before. And that gives us more understanding in our interpretation of what we read. We, we've seen that this group uh, showed up in, verse, in chapter 7. In chapter 7, it says in verse... Uh, I'll read from verse 3 of chapter 7 of Revelation. It says, Do not harm the, the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So Bible is clear. Now there are those who, obviously, they say this is symbolic, they spiritualize it, but I think we have to interpret scripture also not just in light of the immediate uh, context what it says there but also in light of uh, bible context whole of scripture if you spiritualize that text for example says oh it doesn't mean israel it means the church that means god has done away with israel and that's not true paul argues this in romans chapter 9 to romans 11 that the rejection of israel wasn't final by God. It wasn't final. It's not final. You know why? Because God is a covenant keeping God. He still has a plan and purpose for his people. <laughs> not just in the past, but also for the future as well. Christ said they will not see him again until they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And even before he will go back to heaven, the disciples who were Jews, they were asking him, When will you, at what time will you restore the kingdom back to Israel? And Christ didn't tell them that no, there's no such thing as the kingdom, the kingdom being restored to Israel. It's now about the church. You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. That's not what he said. He said it's not for you to know the times and the season which the Father has set in his own order. So there's a time and the season when the kingdom will be restored or Israel will be restored to the kingdom. Because there's one, only one king. It's the kingdom of the king of kings. And he also is also known as the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. That's what scripture tells us. So if I think that God has done away with Israel, the church is, is now about the church. It's easy for me to spiritualize the text and say this is not where it says the children of Israel. I said, no, it's not the children of Israel. It is the church. And that would be a very poor and sad interpretation. There are those who do that who, obviously, they have this theology that's called the replacement theology, that the church has now replaced Israel, which obviously is false. Israel are still God's people, and the purposes of God for them is, is still true Christ. It is true Christ that Jews and Gentiles are saved. It is true Christ that Jews and Gentiles draw near to God. It is true Christ that Jews and Gentiles have an inheritance with God. It is true Christ. He is Israel's Messiah and the Messiah of the whole world. Everyone who places their trust in him. So we find this group there. Chapter 7 and scripture is very, very clear. And we don't need to read into scripture. We just use scripture to interpret scripture. Scripture tells us that uh, they, they are of the tribes of the children of Israel. They were sealed. They are sealed uh, on their forehead. So we come back to our text in chapter 14. And we see again that they are sealed with the Father's name, verse 1. 
on their forehead. Say 144,000. There were Christ among Zion. And compared to the people of the world, the people of the world are sealed as well. If you go back to verse 16 of chapter 13. He causes all, the, the false prophet, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast. They are just as God is branding his people for himself. The enemy is branding his own people for himself. That's what it means with the being branded on, on the forehead or on the arm. They brand with a name. And the name represents the person. You, when you brand something, it belongs to you. You possess it. You are the owner. So that's what's happened. They, 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 those that God has branded, he owns them. And those who the enemy has branded, who receive the mark of the beast, the enemy Owns them. So you see the contrast between what is happening with the world and what is happening to the people of God. What else do we observe between these two groups? It says, verse 2 to 3, the redeemed, those ones who are the people of God, they are worshipping before the throne with harps and a new song, singing. They are singing according to uh, verse 12 of Revelation 7, where you have the idea what they are singing. Before the Lamb, before the throne, they are saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. That's what they are singing there before the Lamb and before the throne. But in the world, you find in Revelation 13, verse 3 to 4, they are, they are, they are marveling after the beast and they are worshipping the dragon. They are saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war? With him. While the redeemed of the Lord, they elect God's own people, they are worshiping God. The people of the earth, they are worshiping the beast. What else do we observe about the redeemed? They are pure, verse 4, and are virgins. And this is not because they are celibate, because God ordained marriage from the beginning. It is the holy command of God. They are pure and are virgins, which is the portion of every believer in Christ, because Christ is their bridegroom. The people of God, they are <coughs> regarded as a bride. The, bride. the bride of Christ. Christ is the bridegroom. So they are pure and they are virgins because they are believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this elect. If we look in uh, Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. If you read. is very similar to what we find here. Because we see two groups of people. We see this 144,000. Who are of the tribes of Israel. And we see before the throne. And before the lamb. We see a multitude of people. It says there. If you go back and see. From every tongue. Every tribe. So this. Tells you of the Gentiles, people of the world. So you have the Jews and the Gentiles. Bear that in mind. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans 1.16. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, both the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul writes as well in Ephesians that God has made these two groups one in Christ. So the plan and purpose of God involves these two groups. It started with Israel, but it doesn't end with Israel. It includes everyone as well, Gentiles. So you see this group, these two groups, before, before, uh, before the Lord, before the throne, and before uh, the Lamb, before the throne, and before the Lamb. And what you read here, you also find in the last chapter as well, as this 144,000 here, they have been sealed, they've been branded on their forehead. You read that everyone who is before the face of God, they see, they see his face. They are also branded, they have, they have the name of God on their foreheads. So what we see here is a picture of, a, a, a complete picture of God's elect. Okay, that's what it means. But 
I think the focus here, because John is seeing so many things, he's seeing so many things at, at different points, and I think the focus here, as we find, shows us about God's branding, his choosing, his, his redeeming these Jewish believers. Okay, they are before the Lamb upon Mount Zion, but the plan and purposes of God, it is not limited to only Jews. Okay? Every tribe, every tongue and nation, they are also part of this plan and purpose. And they are, they are involved in the worship of God. Those who have been redeemed by God. And it says there that they follow the Lamb. These follow the Lamb. Verse 4. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. You read in chapter 13, in contrast to this, the, the people of the world, they are following the dragon. They are following Satan. But these ones here, the redeemed, the one that God has chosen for himself, they are following the Lamb. And it says they are redeemed from among men, from the earth, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And it shows you that they share in the order of Christ's resurrection. Because when Christ rose, he was the first fruit. The first fruits, according to the Jewish feast, it is consecrated, it is set apart for God. It belongs to him. It is given to him. It is received by him. So that is how it was with Christ's resurrection. Christ is the first fruit of those who arise from the dead. And it says, being first fruit to God, they share in this resurrection. And that's our portion. Every one of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes in glory, we are going to rise and reign with him. Why? Because we have believed in him. And we share in his resurrection. Being first fruit to God and to the Lamb. And it says in their mouth, verse 5, was found no deceit. Deceit is falsehood. Again, this is what characterizes the worship system in the world. It is falsehood. Deception. But here, for the ones God has preserved for himself, in their mouth was found no deceit. For they are without fault before the throne of God. They are sinners. And yet they are saints before God. Why? Because they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. While the, those in the world, they are sinners who are dead in their sins. They have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not belong to God. They belong to the enemy. They've been branded by him. They follow him. They worship him. And these ones are before, before the throne of God. They are faultless because they are in Christ. Now someone said to me before that, does it mean that I mean, following what you read there, there are 144,000. 144, Does it mean that those are the only number of people who are going to be in heaven, being in the kingdom of God? I don't think it's limited to that. That number is like a perfect number. It's symbolic of all the ones that God has chosen for himself. And when it says, from each tribe, there are 12 tribes, 12,000. It's like a perfect order. Just like when he chose 12 tribes, 12 disciples, it's like a perfect order. And Christ's disciples are not limited to 12. There are a lot of them. One time he sent over 80. You know, but that 12 is like representative of all the disciples. That's like the, the core. The four laws of Christ. 12. So it's like a, a perfect number as far as God's order. What he has chosen. And it involves everyone that he chooses for himself. Both Jews and the Gentiles. We see the election of the Gentiles even with that as well. Because... Again, going back to Revelation 22, those whom God has chosen, he brands every one of them. So you don't only read here about these one who have uh, the Father's name written on their forehead. At the end, you read about everyone who are before his face. They have his names on their forehead. You find it when, you, when we get to Revelation 22. It is there. So this, this image we find, imagery you find here is, gives us a full and complete picture of all God's elect so the first point obviously has to do with this people of God and that's what we find in 1 to 5 it has to do with this people of God that he has set apart for himself and the second part has to do with the proclamation of the gospel verse 6 to to 13 from 6 to 13, this has to do with the proclamation of the gospel. And 
we see God's opportunity to a world that has rejected him before his wrath comes. That is what the gospel is. It is God's opportunity for man to be saved. And the gospel involves promises of us being saved, of us receiving life, if we turn to God. It also involves warnings of the wrath of God if we do not turn to God, if we do not receive Him. And here in our text, we find that it is an, the, 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 we find angels. There are angels who are preaching the gospel, which tells us that God is doing things differently at this point in human history. The normal means whereby the gospel will be shared through. Those who have received this gospel through ministers of the gospel. People that Christ has saved. We don't find out here. It's not people preaching the gospel. It's angels. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. What is the gospel? It's the good news about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And the angel is flying there. It mentions the everlasting gospel. It's flying with this everlasting gospel, which is the eternal gospel. That unchanging message for eternity past to eternity future of Jesus Christ and his work. The angels they have the angel has the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. It says there to every nation, every tribe, tongue, and people, just about everybody in the world. Giving them the opportunity to turn to God. And we see the mercy and the kindness of God. And you find this several in the book of Revelation. Even in light of that book being a book of judgment. You find the, the, the gospel plea. God striving as, it, uh, as we find in Genesis with the souls of men. To turn to him. And, and you know that's, that's what was happening before the flood came. He was trying and then he says enough. That I will not continue to strive with the soul of man. I will not continue to strive with man. And God gave man up. God left man to himself. And we see in the midst of judgment, God is giving man the opportunity to be saved before the end comes. But as we can discern here with the situation on the, on the earth, man has rejected God finally. <coughs> Man's rejection of God is final. He has passed the point of no return. So much so that he has been branded with the name. That mark has to do with the name. And the name has to do with the person. Who the person is. He has been branded with the mark of the Antichrist. He has made himself the child of the devil. A candidate of hell. He has rejected God. The gospel involves warning. Firstly, that Jesus saves, Christ saves. And secondly, what does the gospel involve? What does this one involve? Christ saves and he saved from the wrath to come. There is a coming wrath. The gospel tells us to flee to Christ and evade the judgment of God. But the world has passed the point of fleeing to Christ. They are not fleeing to Christ. They are following the Antichrist. They are not directed to the redemption of Christ now by the angel who's preaching the gospel. They're not directed to Christ's redemption. They are uh, directed to the Christ of creation, the one who is George. Fear God. He says there, verse 7, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son. And this here is referring to God the Son. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the spring of water. He is Christ as the God of creation. 
God created everything through His Son. It is referring to God the Son. And He's referring to Christ, not in His redemption now, because the world has passed the point of turning to God. And even with that gospel plea, they can't respond because they are following the Antichrist. And the gospel now is for them to fear this God of creation and worship Him. The first angel is seeking to woo the inhabitants of the earth to turn them to this Christ who is the God of creation. The second angel in verse 8, he follows now declaring woo on this false worship system. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of our fornication. Obviously, again, this has to do with idolatry. This is the cup of God's indignation now, which they are going to partake of because they have drunk of that wine of the wrath of her fornication. They have been given to the idolatries of this beast system. And because of that, they would reap the consequence. They will suffer the wrath that that spiritual adultery brings that punishment and if you think of going back to Lord Jesus Christ this wrath of God God's indignation that is in the cup as it were Christ drank all of it that's what the death on this, his death on the cross that's what it means that's why he said in the garden of Gethsemane when he was sweating great drops of blood so if it is possible, let this cup pass from him. He will drink that cup so that we won't, we won't have to suffer that wrath of God. So if we reject Christ, you would receive that wrath of God. You will receive it. Without Christ, you will receive it. Outside of Christ, you will receive it. But in Christ, that wrath has passed over you. You have passed from death to life. You will not partake of that cup of God's wrath, the wrath of his indignation. And again, this shows us that at this time in human history... The world is giving over. It's beyond the point of repentance. They can't turn because they've given themselves to him. They, they are going to partake of that wrath of God's indignation. What, what does it involve? It continues. Verse 10. Uh, I mean, verse 9. Look, look where it says, Then a third angel, now, the third angel now following, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, these are those of the world. What did he say? Verse 10. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented. This is what it involves. This is what it means. He will be tormented in the lake of fire, the fire and brimstones, in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of, of the Lamb. And this is the ultimate end, as we see in Revelation uh, uh, 20. It says, Their torment ascends forever and ever. Verse 11. And they have no rest day or night. When the saints are in everlasting Sabbath, everlasting rest, enjoying in the kingdom of God, these will have no rest day or night. Who are they? Who worship the beast? It's repeating itself what it says in verse 9. It's saying the same thing again. Those who worship the beast and receive the mark of his name. The mark of his name. The mark has to do with his name. The name has to do with this person. They've been branded by the devil. They belong to him. They are his. And they suffer. The wrath of and that's why the devil tries to deceive people because he wants to destroy them. That's what Christ said in John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief doesn't come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He is deceived so that he can destroy the lives of men. Oh, that will turn to the Lord, we turn to this dear Savior and receive his salvation and receive his mercy and become part of his glorious kingdom. And it says there in verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience of the saints. This is written to encourage us, the people of God. To encourage us in our endurance, in our enduring, in our not giving up. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Again, this, this alludes to what we read in chapter, seven, uh, uh, chapter 12, rather, about the, 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 the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman. What do you say there in, in verse 17? Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's, it's saying almost the same thing. 
those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Still speaking to the same group of people. Jewish believers, every believer who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They have the faith of Jesus. And then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, verse 13, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. The Spirit confirms those words. That they may, be, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. They are promised everlasting rest and everlasting reward. They rest from their labors and their works follow them. They go into that everlasting comfort and repose. And what a contrast to the people of the world who ultimately would be tormented in the lake of fire. And scripture says there, verse 11, they have no rest day or night. But the people of God, they rest from their labors. They rest. What God gives to his own, rest. Everlasting rest. Comfort. Repose. But the ones who follow the enemy, they have no rest. They have no So you see this contrast. So I say the tale of Tupi. You see those who God has redeemed, who is um, who are his, is branded from himself, he has his mark upon, and those who you know follow the, the devil and the false worship system, and they, they, they are branded by him, they belong to him, they are marked by him. So you see this contrast, and that's what you see constantly in the book of Revelation. Of these two, two, uh, two, two kinds of people, and uh, the worship that is true and the worship that is false, and uh, those who are redeemed and those who are condemned, and, and those who are saved ultimately, and those who uh, receive the judgment of God. You see this constantly, and John uh, sees this in many ways. So we have to ultimately interpret that this would be the lot of the righteous and this would be the lot of the wicked. That's what it shows ultimately as we see. In, uh, from verse 14 to the end which has to do the, with the third point the final part which is the portion of God's people and the people of the world the first has to do with uh, the people of God we saw who they were uh, branded by God the second has to do with the proclamation of the gospel which was God's opportunity to the world that has rejected him and finally we see the portion ultimately the end as it were of these two groups of people. From verse 14, uh, John sees two kinds of harvest here. He sees two kinds of harvest. And this is actually one harvest at the end of the age. But this harvest has two ends. And this is illustrated by John seeing two harvests. The first harvest, verse 14 to 16. It says, then I look and, and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man. See, when, that, when scripture uses those words, it's describing that our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to, you know, read too much into that text. Oh, he's an angel. No, no, no. It's, it's descriptive of Christ. He's the son of man. That's the title that he owned. Even in Daniel, when Daniel talked about the son of man, he was speaking about Christ. One like unto the son of man. Having on his head a golden crown. Talks about his Royalty, his king, his sovereignty. And in his hand, a sharp sickle. It's the harvest of the earth is due. And uh, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him, capital letter H, him, the Lord, who sat on the cloud, is coming with cloud. That's what he said in Matthew. He's coming with the cloud. Trust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of... Now, now this harvest is... The street of the wheat harvest. And the wheat has to do with the people of God in scripture. Where you find the wheat. It has to do with the people of God. And a time has come for him to take his own. Those who belong to him. Take them into God's barn. As it were. The kingdom of God. When Christ comes in glory. This is the ingathering of the wheat. Into the kingdom of God. The people of God. This is what this shows us. is It's like the wise virgins. Going into the wedding supper of the Lamb. The sheep going into the kingdom. And contrary to this, verse 17 to 20, this has to do with the people of the world who worship the Antichrist and are branded by him. 
son of man gathers the harvest of wheat those who are his own and he gathers them into the coming kingdom but here john sees another angel with a sharp sickle that's what it says in verse 17. he came out of the temple you know the bible is very very clear it says another angel this is not like one one like the son of man with a crown no it says another angel comes out of the temple which is in heaven having a sharp sickle he also come to harvest as well Verse 18, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Trust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for our grapes are really full. So what this means is a judgment. See, so the angel trust, in, trust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth, and they threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And... This is the grape harvest, and the great harvest is illustrative of the judgment of the wicked because the grapes are trampled, they're crushed, it bleeds. So that's what you read there in verse 20. The wine press was trampled outside the city, and, and, and blood came out of the wine press. It's, it's figurative language, a great slaughter, a great destruction. And it says there, it was, it was trampled outside the city. This city is verse 8. That city, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The great city. And this city is illustrative of this false worship system of the world. The heart of it. That is what is illustrated by this city. Illustrative of this city. It's trampled. So what it just simply means there, it means the destruction of the wicked, those who follow this false uh, religious system of the Antichrist and the false prophet. That's what it means there by them being harvested, they're thrown into that great wine press of God's wrath and they're trampled. So this is the great slaughter at the end of the age when Christ comes in glory. When he comes, some people will be redeemed, his people, and some people. They will suffer judgment because he comes as as judge, and and that judge, the judgment will involve separation. Some would come to everlasting rest and receive their reward, and some uh, will be will be condemned. There are always two kinds of people, and the Bible makes this clear to us: the people of God and the people of the world, the wheat and the tears, the wise virgins. And the foolish virgins, the sheep and the goats, the redeemed who stand with Christ on, on Mount Zion, faultless before the throne of God, and the condemned who stand with the Antichrist in Babylon, that false religious movement. And ultimately we see at the end that the people of God, the redeemed, they are taken into the kingdom of God and they enjoy everlasting rest and reward while the people of the world are condemned to the lake of fire where it says the, 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 the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night truly sad and tragic but now in the here and now uh, we have the, this gospel opportunity we have this gospel appeal we have this choice being presented before us choose you this day whom you shall serve you see these two peoples you see these two ways and these two ends placed before you may we be wise this day to choose the way of christ to embrace the way of christ to hold on to that way of christ may this day be our day of salvation may we hear the voice of the spirit of god telling us choose christ this day choose him that you may live and may we obey that voice amen, amen.